Remember, what we see determines what we do. In aggression, insight is so important because we get past the alienating, offensive nature of aggression to see in the child. If we can see in the child, we can get the sense this child is frustrated. They're up against a futility that they cannot change. They have not felt it. It's a very simple insight and it informs our dance. It, it absolutely uh, changes how we, uh, how we interact. Frustration isn't a bad thing. It's a wonderful thing. Frustration is a powerful working emotion that is absolutely essential to be there. We don't even have words for it with our children. We don't even bring it into consciousness. Uh, we hardly talk about this at all. Um, in fact, we misname it when we misname it as anger. And again, the problem with anger, you see, if you go to anger, I'll come back to this. But if you, if you think anger, you're thinking cerebral cortex, the rational. Anger is, uh, when one is angry when it's somebody's fault. When we think it's somebody's fault that something doesn't work. And so we get angry. And so when we think of it as anger, we, the first thing we do, we ask the child the question, why did you hit your sister? Why? We're looking for a reason, not an emotion. But we're, we should be looking for the emotion. You see, if we do this, it changes everything. Oh my goodness, honey, something's not working for you. But when we think, when we overlay our responsibilities with children, somehow we've lost that intuition. We see them up chucking and all of this attacking energy, and we think it's a behavioral problem. When no, they have all kinds of things to adapt to. They got a new baby sister. Uh, Mom and dad broke up. Uh, this isn't working for them. They're not getting the marks that they, uh, they desire at school. Nothing is there. Uh, they've got rejected by a best friend. And if they haven't had their tears about it, the aggression is going to come out someplace. It's going to come out in attacking others, attacking themselves, and so on. Then that is, that is it. Once you understand adaptation, you simply understand aggression. Aggression happens when adaptation doesn't. Aggression happens when adaptation doesn't. It's as simple as that. In the education system, we've all been the idea that if a child knows better, they will behave better. So the idea is, is let me get that into your thick head. And once you know better, I hold you accountable for being able to behave better. So we have this interaction. Let's say Christine is talking while you're talking. And uh, so you have this talk with Christine. You know, when I talk, uh, I don't want you to talk. Do you understand that? Yes. You understand if you talk, I'm going to send you to the office. Do you understand that? Yes. Will you promise not to talk while I'm talking? Yes. And so you think you've had this tremendously effective intervention and everything is now well. You get back to your talking post, you start talking, and Christine starts talking at the same time. And so you go to her and you say, did we not have a talk? She nods her head. Did you not say you wouldn't talk? She nods her head. Uh, do you not uh, know, did, did, uh, uh, did, did you not understand that you were not supposed to talk? She nods her head. You say, well, why did you do it? She goes, I don't know. She knew better. But she couldn't behave better because the impulse to talk came into her head and eclipsed everything that was in conflict with it. Do you know how many people operate that way? We think they know better. Well, they know better in terms of do they know, know it was wrong? Did they know they'd get into trouble? Yes. Could they think of it at the time they had the impulse to hit, to, to talk, to do it? No. Why? Because that would require integrative functioning you see that would require the ability to think twice that is to have a conflicting thoughts or feelings in your head and that requires a functional prefrontal cortex and if she does not yet have Christine does not yet have a functional prefrontal cortex it doesn't matter how good her intentions are, and she may have the best intentions. And it doesn't matter how much she knows, her brain will make a fool of her as soon as there's another idea in her head. She won't be able to keep it there. And we humiliate those children. 
we put them down. Because if they do things, when we think they know better, then they obviously did it on purpose. And so we see them as defiant. We see them as this. When we don't understand that, that their development is riddled with deficits. Can't we believe at least in their intentions? Can't we believe at least if that they could, they would? When we send the child back into recess saying don't get into trouble. When we say don't hit your sister. When we so don't do this. The assumption is, is that you could control this. Now, if it's a result of immaturity, it's completely different. And it shifts the responsibility. And that's primarily it. If you don't perceive it as immature, and that's one of the most important perceptions, we adjust our perceptions around this. And perception of the child, as soon as we get this part, it shifts the responsibility from the child to us. When you understand its immaturity, you're not expecting the behavior to be changed in a day. You're not expecting any instant results. And the first person to change is ourself. And if we can change the way we're handling it, we'll ultimately get there. The brain can do things, two things, very, very well. It can move us to mature, and it can defend us against a vulnerability too much to bear. But it cannot do both. It's great at doing both part of the time. That's the answer. When things go wrong, they go wrong at the level of feeling. That we are, when, uh, when we're defended against a vulnerability too much to bear, we lose the feelings of fulfillment, of dissonance, of futility. They're no longer there. And if they're not there, this whole infrastructure of maturation disappears. But if we don't know what should be there, we don't know what's missing. That's why a model of the unfolding of human potential and of how it works is so important. We have no idea. And we trip all over these holes of what is missing in these children. But these holes in, in, in children as well as in the universe are not benign. They are black vortexes of energy. And in this case, the energy uh, spews forth uh, non-compliance, underachievement, disruptive behavior, impulsive behavior, learning problems, and aggression. This is what gets all, all our attention. But it's what's missing, what's missing that tells the story. To this day, bullying is being seen as, as problem behavior that is a result of power imbalance. No, when you see this, when you see it, it becomes so self-evident and it's so simple. What is happening is we've got an epidemic of alpha children, but we also have an epidemic of a flight from vulnerability. The two combined are causing and creating, a giving rise to bullying like we've never seen before and a playground and social media like they've never had before and so we've got a problem on our hands which we are not going to be able to address through consequences uh, through battling at the symptoms we have got uh, to be able to address the underlying problem uh, the underlying problem is two things the flight from vulnerability and the alpha complex if, if even one of those is addressed uh, then it changes it. When lacking natural attachment to power, unfortunately, we, uh, when we don't know the source of our own uh, lack of natural attachment power, we misdiagnose it and we think it's because we don't know enough. And so it's estimated that 95% of parenting literature is basically trying to tell uh, parents how to manage their children. That's not the answer. We've been doing this for tens of thousands of years. It's not more know-how. It's that we're losing the context in which to raise children. We need to cultivate their attachments with us. Or many parents of adolescents are giving up. They sense the lack of natural power and influence. And so it's too, it's too, uh, uh, too wounding. They give up. And of course, many are seeking force and are resorting to force uh, to leverage uh, to finding out, okay, what is a child attached to? 
What is a child attached to? You see, intuitively, we know the answer is in attachment. That's where the power lies. So we say, well, what does a child care about? What are they attached to? What's important to them? And you've all heard parents say, I don't know what else to take away from this child. They're busy trying to find where does their power lie? Well, that's a dreadful statement about relationship. And as soon as we even communicate to a child again uh, that we don't believe in their desire to be good for us, we make it very difficult for that to become true. Can we be too attached? No, not too attached. This was a misunderstanding. It's a misunderstanding. It's when children are so preoccupied with contact and closeness, when the preschooler can't bear to be separated uh, from mommy, from daddy, when they're absolutely obsessed with proximity, we say they're too attached. No, they are pro they, they're too attached. They're, they're, they're too obsessed with, with physical proximity or being with because they're not attached deeper through being able to be the same, through belonging, uh, through significance, uh, through sharing of hearts, and through being known. The fact is, is the deeper you are attached, the more you can hold close when apart. And again, that's the whole, that's the whole design of this. When you see what nature has done, the whole, the whole design of this is to answer the basic human problem, is how do we... How do we stay close when apart? How do we preserve connection when we're not with? And when you look at the design of attachment in that way, you say, no, it, the child isn't attached enough. The child isn't attached enough. And so we would change the question from trying to help this child handle separation to trying to help this child hold on. Preserve the connection, hence the title of my book. Hold on to your kids. Because if we can hold on to them, then they don't have to. They, then they can let go and become their own persons. It has nothing to do with your role. It has everything to do with their attachment. And this is it. Nature designates who is empowered to take care of the child for better or for worse. And we had best honor that and try to make the most of that. And so my life has been committed to working with the adults to whom the children are attached. If I can work with them because they are already designated by nature as the ones who, are, who, who the child is going to seek to be taken care of, I best work for them, and, or rather through them, to try to, for them to become the teacher, uh, the parent, the therapist that child needs.